reporting. And let's share a screen. We are going to go through uh, for our exam two review. We're just going to go through uh, the learning objectives for our unit two. So chapters two, three, four, and five. All right. So chapter two is basic chemistry, uh, and our learning objectives for this chapter were to list the six elements that make up about 95% of most organisms. Everybody should know what these are. We are made of schnapps, and that would be the phonetic pronunciation of those elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Put those together, C-H-N-O-P-S, schnapps. Uh, we put those together into different uh, configurations that we'll get to in the next chapter to make our macromolecules. Everybody should recognize the typical structure of an atom, that Bohr model, with a central core, the nucleus, not to be confused with the nucleus of a cell, but the nucleus of an atom, which contains the protons, the positively charged particles, and the neutrons, the neutrally charged and the uncharged particles. Um, and around that central core, we have orbiting electrons uh, in orbitals. So if you think of a um, solar system model, that's sort of like what we're looking at. The protons and neutrons would be the sun, and the electrons would be the planets um, spinning around. Now you should be able to calculate the protons, neutrons, and electrons. How many of each do we have? Uh, if you are given the atomic number and the atomic mass. So of these, remember mass, uh, we can not exactly accurately equate that to weight. So the mass uh, is the heft of the atom. Uh, and our protons and neutrons have been assigned a weight or an atomic mass of one atomic mass unit. So when we add up our protons and neutrons, we get our atomic mass, and we don't add in the electrons because they're, they contribute such a small, minute amount to the mass that they are considered negligible. So we give them zero for their mass. So our atomic mass is I have my protons and neutrons. My atomic number is only the number of protons. So if you are given two numbers, the smaller one is always going to be the atomic number of protons. And that atomic number always tells us what element we have. The number of neutrons can shift. We can have uh, more or fewer neutrons than expected, and then we get an isotope. Or we could have more or fewer electrons than we expect, and we get an ion. But our proton number is our proton number. If we know the number of protons, if we know our atomic number, we always know what element we're talking about. Um, so isotopes. Isotopes have the same number of protons, same number of electrons, but different number of neutrons. So their mass number can change. So for example, we talked about carbon-14 that we use for, for dating organic matter. Uh, normally, carbon has a mass number of 12 with six protons, six neutrons. Carbon-14 has eight neutrons. Uh, and there are known ratios. We know the decay rate of those. So we can tell by how much of that type of carbon is present uh, in the ratio of that to our normal expected carbon-12. Um, how long that isotope has been decaying. And there's a, a good discussion of isotopes in the uh, Fukush Fukushima uh, nuclear reactor on page 23, talks about some of the beneficial uses uh, and why isotopes can be dangerous. They can um, release particles that uh, radiation that can damage cells and DNA. Not all we talk about isotopes really in this class. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about electrons, though, because that's where all the action happens. Those orbiting electrons 
orbit in electron shells or energy levels. And the valence shell, no matter how many shells we have, the valence shell is the outermost shell. Uh, and the shells have a set number of electrons that they can hold before they're filled up. The very first electron shell can only hold two uh, electrons. So hydrogen has one, helium has two. Those are the only two elements uh, that only have a single shell. So the valence shell is their first orbital. After that, as we move out, we have more electrons, we're gonna have another shell um, and so on. All we have to worry about for our purposes, because we're looking at uh, biology and organic, uh, biological organic molecules, um, we just have to worry of about a maximum of 20 electrons um, or one, two, three orbitals, because um, that's all we're dealing with. So the, the rules get a little trickier after that. Uh, but ours, after that first shell, two, then the next electron levels have eight and they're filled. The octet rule relates to that because the octet rule says all elements want to have full valence shells. And full means eight electrons. And because they want to be full in their outer shell, their valence shell, they will interact with other elements with the electrons in their valence shell to form bonds. So it's always all about the outer shell when we're forming bonds. Uh, we talk about how elements combine to form molecules through bonding. Uh, you should know the number of atoms of, um, each, uh, of each element in any chemical formula. For example, uh, glucose, C6, H12O6. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. If you're given a chemical equation, you should identify the reactants and the products. So the reactants are what go in, the products are what is produced. So when I write a chemical reaction with an arrow, the products are on the right side if the arrow faces to the right. That's what the outcome of the reaction is. We looked at ionic bonds, so you'll want to go back and watch uh, the lecture video if you aren't sure about that. But ionic bonds, the thing to look for to identify an ionic bond is it's one to one. I have one element and one element. So I would never have C6H12O6. I've got six of one, 12 of another, six of another, two elements. And they're compatible. We know they're compatible because one just needs one more electron to fill its outer orbital, and the other element has a lone electron in its outer shell. So this one will give up that lone electron, leaving it with eight in its outer shell. It's now down one. If it had three outer shell, out three orbitals, it now has two because it lost the one electron in that one. But the second one is full. It has eight electrons. This other element. It had seven in its outer shell and needed just one, picked that up, and now its valence shell is full. By doing that, each of those has become an ion. So my one element that had that poor one lonely electron in the outer ring lost an electron, so it lost one of its negatives. So it's down to negative, meaning it has one more proton than an electron. So it's a positive ion, it has the positive charge. This other element who picked up that electron now has one more electron and proton, so it has a negative charge. Those opposite charge draw those elements together and that's the bond. That's how we can recognize a, an ionic bond. Uh, is we form an ion first by one element giving up an electron, the other gaining it, and then they're drawn together. If you can't see that in the elements and the atomic numbers, uh, then you probably are talking about a covalent bond. So covalent, they cooperate and they share their outer electrons. If they share those evenly, then that means the charge all the way around the molecule is even, positives and negatives, protons and electrons. Um, so that is a nonpolar covalent bond. There is no 
poles. There's no polarity. There's no one positive and one negative pole. Uh, sometimes when we form a molecule, one of the elements is an electron hog. And when it's an electron hog, it keeps the electrons around it for longer than the other element, and it gets a slight negative charge, meaning the other side of the molecule has a slight positive charge. Water is an example of that. Um, so even though all of my elements have a neutral charge overall, one side of the molecule when they come together, for example, water that looks kind of like Mickey Mouse with a big oxygen and two hydrogens, uh, the oxygen is an electron hog. So this side of the molecule is slightly negative, this side is slightly positive by the hydrogens. Uh, and one thing that can happen when I get that polarity is I can get lots of hydrogen bonds forming between the hydrogens of one molecule and another part of another molecule. So in water, my slightly positive hydrogens are drawn to the neighboring molecules, slightly negative oxygens, and those are hydrogen bonds that form. We also looked at the main properties of water that hydrogen bonding makes possible and that allow life to exist. Uh, so we looked at those properties, cohesion, water molecules stick to other water molecules. That gives a surface tension, gives some viscosity, water flow. Uh, it lets water flow up because um, in trees, for example, Solution contains solvent and solute, or water and something dissolvent. Uh, we looked at pH, and the pH scale is a measure of hydrogen potential, hydrogens and hydroxides. Uh, pH, the actual measure, is the inverse log of the number of hydrogens. As an inverse, it means when I count how many hydrogens I have, it goes in the denominator. The bigger the number in the denominator, the smaller the overall number. That's why on the pH scale, low numbers mean high hydrogen ion concentration. So acids have low numbers, less than seven. Bases have higher than seven. Uh, and neutral is seven. Oh, you want to look at the discussion of acid rain on page 32. And... Uh, the last question is summarized how buffers play an important role in the physiology of living organisms. So buffers prevent a pH change. So if I add a lot of acid to a buffered solution, a buffer resists a change in pH. It's going to maintain the same pH. Our bodies maintain homeostasis with a lot of different parameters, one of those being pH. Uh, and we're just getting to the section where we're going to talk about enzymes. So we'll see why pH 
why it's important we maintain homeostasis with regard to pH. Um, and so buffers, our blood has a buffering system, lots of systems in our body, the ocean has a natural buffering system to prevent pH changes because living organisms have set pH ranges that they can survive and function in. All right, so that was our chemistry and our organic molecules in chapter three. They should be able to differentiate organic and inorganic. Not only do I have to have carbon, but I have to have carbons attached to hydrogens. Otherwise, it's inorganic. So carbon dioxide, CO2, no hydrogens, inorganic. Glucose, C6, H12, O6, organic. You have to look for both of those. Uh, the rest of our schnapps, the nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, in my biological macromolecules, my organic molecules, those are also involved, but not required. So depending on what I have, if I have um, carbohydrates, I have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. If I have lipids, I have carbon, hydrogen, more of that, some oxygen, uh, maybe some phosphorus. Uh, proteins, I'm going to have some nitrogen, maybe some sulfur in there. Um, and nucleic acids, I'm going to have phosphorus and nitrogen as well, and oxygen. So all of those components. Um, but how I put those together, remember the analogy of Legos, I can put them together in different ways. Monomers are my building block, my single Lego. How I put them all together in large um, molecules, my macromolecules, that's the polymer. And I build them through dehydration, through dehydration synthesis or a dehydration reaction, which is also known as condensation. I think your lab manual calls it condensation. And hydrolysis, dehydration, I remove all water to join molecules, hydrolysis. Uh, I add a water to split them apart. So I build monomers, or I build polymers from monomers by removing a water. I break down polymers into monomers, monomers by adding a water. So everybody should recognize the formula for carbohydrates. Almost all carbohydrates have one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen, and anywhere from three to seven carbons. So if I had three, it would be C3H6O3. If I had seven, it would be C7H14O7. There are some variations, for example, in deoxyribose our sugar that's in DNA or nucleic acids, in the nucleic acid DNA, uh, deoxyribose, deoxy, that tells you it's got C5, H10, O4. It's down in oxygen. Um, let's see. So you should know that formula. You should know the classes of lipids. We have our... Um, Triglycerides, our phospholipids, our triglycerides, our fats and oils, our phospholipids are the component of biological membranes. Um, tri triglycerides have three fatty acid tails, phospholipids only have two and a phosphate attached, and then waxes and sterols. You know the six basic functions of proteins. So we have receptor proteins, recognition proteins, we have junction proteins that join cells together. Um, we have oh, channel proteins. When we get to the membrane, we'll see channel, uh, channel proteins that act as doorways to get things in and out. Um, they work for movement, transportation, for protection, for moving things in cells um, and moving muscles, moving us. Um, enzymes are the big one. They catalyze chemical reactions. This is a big one because not all, um, not or all organisms have muscles and, um, and big structures, but all organisms have metabolism. The sum total of all the chemical reactions in a cell is metabolism. Every chemical reaction that takes place in our cells is sped up with an enzyme or catalyzed by an enzyme, and enzymes are protein. So that's our big one that we're going to focus on. Uh, we look at how polypeptides are formed from amino acids. That's my primary structure of a protein. And you should know secondary 
tertiary and quaternary structure and why those are important. To know the effects of temperature and pH on protein shape. Uh, and we're going to learn more about this in our discussion of enzymes, how we denature a protein. Heat can break down those bonds that give our protein its specific three-dimensional shape, as can changes in pH. And then you should be able to describe um, nucleic acids, the monomer of nucleotides, five carbon sugar uh, with a phosphate attached and a nitrogenous base. If I put lots of them together into a double-stranded molecule, I get DNA. A single-stranded molecule, I get RNA. I also have ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the five-carbon sugar ribose with the base adenine and three phosphates. When I break off one of those phosphates, I get adenosine diphosphate, and I release lots of energy that my cell can use to do, the, do work. And that's what's coming up again in Unit 3 and Metabolism. So, oh, yeah, so that's coming up ahead. We'll learn more about ATP. All right, that's Chapter 3. Chapter 4. Everybody went through Chapter 4, the lab on the cell structures and functions. If you have not watched my video on those, you want to do that. Uh, so we can differentiate pro early before the seed. Early, no nucleus, prokaryote, eukaryote, true seed. When I look under the microscope, I see that nucleus, that dark center uh, that looks like if I cut a peach in half and it had a seed in the middle. Um, so the eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. I should list the three principles of cell theory. Um, you know the scientific contributions of Schleiden, Schwann, and uh, Virchow, um, who identified plant cells, animal cells, hey, look, they look alike, uh, and then recognizing cells as the basic unit of um, living organisms. So Schwann and Virchow kind of had a race for that. Uh, Virchow got credit, Schwann probably said it first. Let's see, identify the function of prokaryotic structure. So no bacterial cell wall, or bacteria. So all cells, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, have a plasma membrane, have cytoplasm inside, the aqueous solution inside. They have DNA, the instructions for how they do everything they do. And they have ribosomes. Ribosomes are the cytoprotein synthesis. And our proteins are, one class of proteins are enzymes that we need for any chemical reaction to take place. So it's pretty important we have a way to build those proteins. Prokaryotes additionally have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan. Some produce a sticky outer coating for protection called a glycocalyx. A capsule is one type of glycocalyx if it's nice strongly formed, like think of jello. Um, a loosely formed one is called a slime layer. Uh, the nucleoid is the area in the structure where the prokaryotic DNA is found. Plasmids are extra chromosomal DNA. Uh, we about that. And then you should know these flagella, fimbriae, and the conjugation hili as well, what those structures are used for. Uh, I go through the endosymbiotic theory uh, in depth in the video, so you should take a look at that if you haven't yet. That that symbiotic relationship between a large prokaryote and a smaller one that engulfed uh, became so beneficial, they became so entwined that over evolutionary time scales, millions of years, uh, that engulfed structure became a mitochondria, an essential component of eukaryotic cells. It is no longer a free living organism. Uh, similarly, for plants, the chloroplast and the mitochondria um, became. An essential component of the cell as opposed to a symbiont. You should be able to identify the nucleus, chromatin. Chromatin is what DNA is made of, DNA wrapped around proteins, uh, and we organize our chromatin as chromosomes, and our chrom chromosomes carry genes. Recognize the nucleolus, that darker, more dense spot inside the nucleus where we're going to make the RNA and proteins that will go on to become ribosomes. 
and the nuclear envelope, nuclear pores in my eukaryotic cells, and then all of the different organelles. So most of you did a good job in the lab identifying these, uh, the vesicles, the endomembrane system, which includes the nuclear envelope, the smooth, the rough ER, the smooth ER, the vesicles, transport vesicles that can um, break off from there to transport materials and then merge with the Golgi apparatus where those materials can be processed and again, broken off, shipped out of the cell uh, in transport vesicles. Some specialized vesicles that are the garbage men that take out cellular waste and cellular debris, my lysosomes and peroxisomes. Vacuoles, little storage areas, usually bigger than vesicles, usually often involved in uh, water regulation. And as we get to osmosis, you know how that works. The central vacuole is the one supersized vacuole found in plants. And then my cytoskeleton composed of filaments, intermediate filaments, microtubules, uh, the centrioles that organize those. And cilia and flagella used for motility that are made of similar of tubule of these, uh, of these parts of the cytoskeleton and used for movement. Uh, and then you should be able to identify the structures of the chloroplast and the mitochondria. And we're going to look at those much more closely because we're coming up on photosynthesis and cell respiration. So we'll get a zoomed in close up view um, of those in the next week. That was chapter four. On to chapter five, membrane structure and function. Everyone should be able to describe the fluid mosaic model of membrane structure. The fluid portion are those phospholipid bilayers. This sort of has a um, olive oil consistency, so it's fluid. And then embedded in there are those proteins that move around throughout that, uh, that fluid. That's our mosaic. So mosaic is a picture of tiles. So those are considered the, the tiles floating around in that fluid. Uh, I should know the structure and function of the phospholipids. That's what my bile is primarily made of. I have the steroid cholesterol in animal membranes, and that helps to maintain its structural integrity and the proper viscosity uh, that keeps it at the right texture, regardless of temperature changes or what's going on around it. I have embedded proteins that play all those roles that we talked about proteins playing. And then glycolipids and glycoproteins, which, as it says, lipid, a fat, glyco, a sugar, sugar and a fat molecule, glycoproteins, a sugar and a protein molecule. Many of these have specific functions for identifying or play roles in the immune system um, with identifying cells that belong, cells that don't belong. All right, the function of the different proteins. Here are the things that proteins do. Channel and carrier proteins let bigger molecules or charged uh, ions, molecules pass through the membrane. Cell recognition proteins, uh, which are used in the immune system and knowing you belong here, you don't. Receptor proteins that are specific, specific shape to a specific molecule. Use these a lot for hormone. Um, activity where the where receptors be only cells that are impacted by those So let's things go in and out of the cell. Oh, there we go. Oh, didn't want to move. So selective, it chooses what can and cannot pass through that membrane. It can prevent things from entering or it can maintain a concentration gradient 
to make sure uh, that things stay in and don't leak out through diffusion. Um, and then bulk transport. Uh, so we, there's some activity, and that's part of your discussion. There's quite a bit on uh, how we get things in and out of the cell. And one of the important things that we're going to look at is how we get water in and out of the cell. So again, as I mentioned, a solution is a liquid made of the solute, something dissolved in a solvent, water for biology. Water can move just like any other molecule down a concentration gradient. So when it's just any old molecule moving down a concentration gradient, diffusion, water moving down a concentrate down its concentration gradient uh, across a membrane, it's osmosis. And facilitated transport is when I need to have one of those channel proteins to get through because I'm too big, I can't pass through that membrane. Uh, so it's still passive transport, no energy required, still going down the concentration gradient. Um, if you're still struggling with diffusion and osmosis, do look at the videos that I posted on this. They will be very helpful. Um, you should be able to recognize hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic solutions. Those terms uh, are relative. So if I have a solution that is 50% water, 50% sugar, do I know if it's hypotonic or hypertonic or isotonic? Say no. 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 Just because it's 50% solute and 50% solvent does not mean it's isotonic. I'm not looking at the solute to solvent ratio. I'm looking at this solution versus this solution. How much solute is in it? How much of something is dissolved? If this one has 50% salt, and this one has 40% salt, the remainder is water. This is hypertonic. It has more salt than this one. I see this is hypertonic compared to this solution. This has less solute in it, so it is hypotonic compared to this one. And water will move across the membrane toward the hypertonic solution. That confuses you because it sounds like it's going up the concentration gradient. Water's concentration is the reverse. So if this is 50% solute, it's 50% water. If this is 40% solute, it's 60% water. The so water mo moves from the higher water concentration to the lower water concentration which is the higher solute concentration. Water moves toward the hypertonic solution. Uh, and you should recognize those terms, sugar pressure, turgidity, ter hemolysis, plasmolysis, granation. Um, describe active transport and these different uh, methods of bulk transport. Exocytosis, I get things out of the cell with those transport vesicles. Endocytosis, I make a vesicle from my plasma membrane to pull things into the cell. Phagocytosis, phago is eating. This is solids and big particles. Phenocytosis, I remember this one by thinking Pinot Noir wine. This is pulling in liquids or smaller particles. And then receptor-mediated endocytosis, those receptor surface receptors latch to the molecules and then the membrane pulls them in. Uh, and it requires energy, so it can go with the concentration gradient against it, however it needs to go, because um, I'm using energy so I can push against that concentration gradient. And then the last portion looked at uh, those proteins and the structures that make connections, cell-to-cell uh, -cell junctions um, in animals or in plants. So if that was too fast for you. What I recommend is not necessarily watching this again, but going to the lecture videos that are posted uh, or the other short videos that are posted on any of the portions of this um, that you uh, that you were not um, clear on. And so, 
Uh, if you have any questions between now and the time you take your exam, um, which your exam will be available beginning Sunday, so Saturday, 12 o'clock, 12.01 is Sunday, beginning midnight Sunday through midnight Tuesday, the 13th through the 15th. Uh, same format as exam one. I hope you do as well as you did on exam one. It does require Respondus Lockdown Browser and the monitor. Um, and just a word, please pay attention to the academic integrity information um, that is posted at the start of the video. I do need to see your ID at the start of the videos. I do need to have you do the environmental check at the start of the videos, and I do need your face present. So you see how I have head and shoulders present in the video? I need head and shoulders present. Um, if all I'm seeing is the top of your head and the wall behind you, I will assume that you are looking at a book or a phone in your lap and you will receive a zero. If you Stop notifications when you are being notified um, that you are out of the video. I will assume you are cheating and you will get a zero. So that web camera is there for a reason. Uh, make sure it is on and it is on you and that it is recording you the whole time so that I can tell that you aren't sitting here with your textbook looking down in your lap. Uh, as you answer, um, or with your phone, uh, I think some students think we don't check those. We had quite a few instances, not in our class, uh, of people blatantly you know, picking up looking at their phone on screen while being recorded. Uh, don't do that. Um, so please follow the rules. Uh, and read that honor code. It's what you signed up for with the class, so follow that. I think you all are a great class and you're doing fabulous, so I am I'm not worried that you are cheating. I just want to make sure that when we do random checks, it's not anybody in my class who is going to be called out. All right. Good luck on the test, and I will see you all next week.